Welcome to another episode of Pile Move Makers. This series was created with a simple goal in mind, to bring to the table high-level executives, successful entrepreneurs, and just all-around inspiring human beings, not just focusing on their successes, but more important, shining a spotlight on the journey that they traveled to get there. Now, this week's guest, I had to bring on the show because I get a lot of people asking me, Sean, can you bring somebody on who can really have a deep dive conversation about what it takes to become a successful, not just a successful, but a reality TV show superstar? And I can think of nobody better than this gentleman here who used to be my intern, and he was a damn good intern at that. Please welcome to this episode of, or this week's episode of Power Move Makers, Mr. Rich Dollars. Rich, what's up, brother? Hey, Sean, what up? <laughs> Yo, good to have you on the show, man. Man, thanks for having me, man. Long overdue, bro. Yes, it is. It's long overdue. First, I want to tell people, because people might not know your backstory. I know everybody knows you from Love & Hip Hop, but mm -hmm. long before Rich was on Love & Hip Hop, I, you know... He, he's credible. He was a, a, a star in the music industry. This is not something that he just does for TV or says that he did, you know, and did not have a name in the music industry. Rich was my intern. He was a really great intern. I gave him his job. And what I loved about Rich so much is he followed two basic rules of mine. Number one, get the job done at all costs. Rich, you know I do not accept excuses, period. And Rich was good. I mean, actually, you were great. You did whatever it took to get the job done, and you'd apologize in the morning. And the second basic rule, Rich, do you remember my second basic rule that I had with, with any of you guys who worked for me? Remain loyal. Oh, loyal. I mean, that's just who I am. But as I said, you, 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 you'll go back. I don't have a problem, and this is for anybody who is watching this. I don't care what it is that you're doing in your life. I never have a problem with somebody making a mistake. Just don't make that mistake twice. twice. Period. Yep, that was my thing. I tell people that to this day. Yeah. I tell people that that's how I survived in my career at music, was knowing that I could mess up tonight and come back, and you would look at me and be like, bro, I'm not, I'm going to cover for you now. I'm not going to let them come for your neck today. Don't do it again. And that was, I literally have lived by that. I, th I think it's important because people are so afraid to fail. People are so afraid to put themselves out there and get it wrong. Getting it wrong is not the problem. It's nothing wrong with that. But learn from it and do not make that same mistake twice. Rich. Exactly. You, you know, just, and I wanted to bring that out because I know people know you now as a reality TV show superstar, but people might not realize long before you ever got on that show, you were really great as an employee working records for Bad Boy Records, working along people like myself, Hard Pierre, Sean Diddy Combs for many, many years. So just establishing your credibility. For anybody watching this, I want to extract as many gems and as much information from you to help somebody who is in middle America, somebody who might not be in Los Angeles or in New York. You know, if they're looking to become a reality TV show star, start with me. How did you first get on your show? And then we'll go into how somebody else can get discovered. Well... Obviously, my background at Bad Boy helped me because I was known in the music industry. So the way things used to be 10 years ago when I first started was there was, a, there was more substance oriented. So when Love & Hip Hop came, they were looking for artists who were credible. In that time, it was Jim Jones. Then they were looking for people who worked, and it was Olivia, and it was people who worked in the industry. So I was the person who worked in the industry with Yandy Smith, and it was like that. So the, back, the basic background was that People knew me in New York City. People knew me as working for Bad Boy Records. They knew who Rich Dollars was, right? So when constructing a show, they were like, okay, we want people that we know are credible, have substance, and that can come on here and essentially talk about what their paths and what they're doing, as well as what they're doing now. And at that time, it was managing Olivia. 
So when we joined the show, that's kind of how it all started. Okay. You're talking specifically love and hip hop, which makes sense. Right. You have a background in the music industry. Mm -hmm. But for any reality TV show out there, it's not like you can go and, you know, go on to some of these sites, uh, LinkedIn or, or any of these right. sites that have job postings. How do people get discovered? How do you even know when there's a new reality TV show that are looking for cast members? How, you know, do you know for existing reality TV shows that are looking to bring new blood into the mix? Where, where can people get this information? Well, now, well, back then it was kind of word of mouth. It was kind of, oh, there's a new show that's about to come out. It's called Love and Hip Hop. Or there's this show called Housewives or where Ray J was doing the dating show. And it was like, I need a bunch of girls. So it was kind of word of mouth. But now it's way more detailed and intricate. You can go out there and there's like literally casting calls. Now, the reality TV shows? Correct. Correct. They won't tell you that you're being casted. They'll say music industry person, people with this kind of background, people who do this, people who work at strip clubs or bartenders or whatever it may be that you're doing, come out. We want to interview you for a reality show. They'll never say what it is. But when you get there, because it's so reality shows have become so popular now that they're specific. So now it's like, if you're a bartender, there's reality shows about bartenders. Or if, you have hit, if you're a chef, then there's reality shows about being a chef. So they literally have casting calls, and then they go and they do their research on you, and they start to pry into your background, into your innermost secrets to find out if, in fact, you would even be good television. But the first initial thing was, like, literally, they have casting calls now. Okay. Where do I find these casting calls? Are there specific apps? Are there websites? What should I be signed up to or what should I look out for so that I can at least, you know, I might not know it's for a reality TV show, but mm -hmm. I at least have the knowledge that they're looking for somebody. The funny thing is you can actually look in the trade magazines now. There's like, and remember how when you were looking for a, 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 a job in the city and you wanted to be on Broadway, where you go to the Village Voice and those kind of places? Mm -hmm. You can go to those same trade magazines now. There's those same trade magazines that are having auditions for regular television shows, unscripted television shows, or scripted television shows, or whatever it may be. They have those same things for reality now. It's, it's become all meshed into one. Rich, how long have you been on Love & Hip Hop? This was my 10th season on New York. Overall, I've done... 10 years and 12 seasons of Love and Hip Hop. Wow, so you, you're an expert in this area because people have come, people have gone. We see reality TV shows all the time. You have somehow cracked the code. You have figured out how I can not only be a cast member on these shows, but have longevity, make myself such an integral part of this show that season over season, they need me, or I won't even word it that way, but my character is needed to be on that show. That's incredible. Walk me through, what does a interview process look like? Say I do, you know, find out that, hey, they're having this casting call. Mm -hmm. And I'm fortunate enough to get called in for it. What does a typical interview look like to get on TV? Well, first of all, they want to they want to do what's called an on camera, because obviously they always want to know what you look like on camera. So a lot of people are, you know, they look sort of one way on, on in real life and then you see them on TV and they look a lot different. So mm -hmm. that's that's the first thing they want to do. They want to see how you actually look on the television screen. The second thing is what's going on in your life. Like. A lot of people want to come on television and only want to give what they want to give. And that's never going to be good television that you can't, you can't, it's a give and a take. So if you want to come on here and you're not, if you're an artist or whatever you are, and you want to promote what your, what your, I guess what your number one claim to fame would be, you still have to give things in your personal life because it's a reality TV show and it really doesn't work unless you're willing to give up some personal tidbits because nobody wants to watch Love and Hip Hop or any of these shows, if in fact you're only coming on here to sing a record, or if you're only coming on here to cook, or if you're only coming on here to take pictures and be a model. They want to know what that person is. 
who that person is and what makes that person tick. And then that kind of pushes your claim to fame, your, your trait, your, your number one quality to the background because your personality and you as a person kind of takes over what your storyline would be. So that, I mean, that's kind of what it is. And that's, that's what really, really hinders a lot of people. They don't want to give that up. They really just don't want to give that up, Sean. If you go back and we can talk about Olivia. Olivia was an amazing artist. She could sing, but she never wanted to give up the personal tidbits of her life. She never wanted people to see who she was dating. She never wanted the people to see her cry. She always wanted to make it seem as though everything was just so honky dory. And that's not what people want to see because it's not, it's not relatable. So the number one trait to being a reality TV person is you have to be relatable to the audience. The audience has to look at you and say, oh my God, I, I've been there. I've seen that. I've done that. I've been with that. I've been in that situation. And that makes them relate to you, which in turn makes them like you. Okay. So, and, and, and I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves because I, I, I got a lot to go over with you. In the interviewing process, okay, how long is the interviewing process? You said you do on cameras. How, how long mm -hmm. is that? Is, is, is it a day's worth of on cameras? Do I have 15 minutes and I got to, you know, shine within these 15 minutes? Typically, what does that look like just in terms of length of time? Probably a good hour, hour and a half. Really? Yeah. So yeah. within an hour and a half, I'm expected to expose all of these different areas of my life because I get what you're saying. You got to be willing to open up. Correct. But some people might go in and I get it with, you know, you're on Love and Hip Hop, but there, there, there could be, you know, reality TV shows about real estate, um, you know, mm -hmm. real housewives. Within that hour, hour and a half, I'm supposed to be willing to divulge that much about myself? Yes. You're supposed to go into that interview and basically you leave nothing, no stone unturned. So I go into it and it's like, okay, Rich, Rich Dollars, what's up? What's up? I'm Rich Dollars from Bad Boy Records. This is what I'm doing. This is what I am. You can call Sean Prez about me. You can call Sean Combs about me. You can ask all these different people and know that my story is actually an accurate story and I'm not you know, lying to you. And then I go into my personal life and this is what I'm doing and I'm dating such and such. And this is my girlfriend. We have problems. So all those questions are day one questions. All those questions are day one questions. They want to know everything about you. Are so you, you come in as a, I'm sorry, uh, Rich, go ahead. I'm sorry. If you go in, if you're coming into this thing as a music industry person, they want to know about the music and who have you worked with and, and, and what have you done and what are your accolades and what was some of the, some of the craziest shit that's happened to you in music and they take it to the personal and then they want to know, are you married? Do you have children? Is there baby mama drama? Do you have a girlfriend that you're dating now? What's going on with that? Because that's all part of your story. And they literally ask these questions day one. Interview one. They ask all these questions. You do this on camera. Mm -hmm. Are you on camera by yourself? Yes. Do they put sure. you in positions with other people who you may not know? Like, what does that part look like? You know? No. The first interview is you're sitting there and it's like literally, it's like a camera pointed at you and you're basically interviewing. You're taking an interview and it's you by yourself Who's sitting room, on the chair. Rich? Huh? Who's in the room? You and the producers. So it's just you and the producers. There's no other cast members. No other cast members. Okay, go ahead. And then they ask you and they start asking you. So it's just you and the camera and, and the producers are asking you questions. And then they say, okay, well, Rich Dallas is already on this show. Do you know Rich Dallas? And they start asking you questions about people. That's how they get to the bottom and the nitty gritty of who you got beef with, what you, who you don't like, who you know, who you don't know, all these different, who you slept with in the past. Because essentially these circles are pretty small, right? So if I'm coming in and I'm doing Love and Hip Hop New York, it's going to be a bunch of New York people. It's going to be a bunch of music industry people. There's going to be a bunch of artists. It's going to be people who I should have dealt with in my past. They're going to ask me my relationship with those people. And then that's how you get into the meat and bones of it because they're asking you all these questions and they're just going back and forth and they're berating you with all these questions. But you're on tape. And that's the tricky part because when you leave that room, you don't even remember some of the shit you said. <laughs> but they remember all of it because they're looking at that videotape and they're saying, 
oh, Rich got beef with such and such. He frowned up when I asked him about such and such. Oh, that's interesting. So now let me get such and such in and ask him about that. So that's how they start getting into the beat, meat and bones of where, who you really are and what you got going on. Typically, how many interviews is it before you know I got accepted to the show? I would say probably in today's, in today's age, probably four or five. So they probably bring you back four or five times. So if your phone continues to ring, hey, would you like to come back in for another interview? You can start to think to yourself, I'm getting closer to the finish line. They're liking what they're hearing. They're like, exactly. So the more times that you communicate with these people, and it could be, it could be, you know, an interview doesn't necessarily have to be them bringing you back in a hundred times. It could be them. Now they're starting to communicate with you and what's going on for your day to day. Oh, Hey Rich, what's up for the day? What you got going on? Oh, uh, I see you on, I see your Instagram and I see you doing such. So now you start to take a, take notice of the fact that, Oh, these people are paying attention. Not only did I do an interview, but now they're following me on Instagram. They know what I'm doing in my day to day. They know, you know, they've asked other people about me because now they're starting to come back with information from different sources. So now they want to bring you in and they want to ask you all these questions before the cameras go up. And that's how they essentially have determined who you are, if you're going to be good for this television show, who you have drama with. They know all that stuff before cameras go up. So now they can start to position you for good TV. Got you. Are there any special skills that a person would need to almost ensure that they would get on one of these reality TV shows. You know what, Sean? I hate to say this, but the crazier your life is, is the more interested they are in you. So, and I say I hate to say that because there used to be a time where your talent was substance. I equate this to the music industry, something that we can both like really, there used to be a time when the music industry was all about substance. Can you sing? Can you dance? Are you a triple threat? They didn't really care about who you were as a person because they wanted to make you who they wanted you to be anyway. Nowadays, music industry is, we don't want to do a and anymore. We don't want to put you, we don't want to do publicity stunts and do things. We want you with social media and your and your and your whatever your platforms are, we want you to show the world who you are and create your base. That's the way reality TV is. It used to be substance and oh my gosh, she can sing and we want to help her take her career to the next level. Now it's she can sing, but she ain't trying to give up nothing. She can sing and she's beautiful, but she don't never have no boyfriend and there's never no personal shit going on. And it's not our job to make your career take off. It's your job to come here and give us enough quality, in-depth who you are to make a good television show. And if music and singing is part of that, then amazing, beautiful. But that's not gonna be your sole purpose on this show is that every time we see you on the scene, you're shooting a video, you're singing a record, you're getting $100 million in iTunes sales because and never ever giving us anything. Do you think this same ideology of kind of the more interesting your life is. Does that apply across all reality TV shows? Yes. Because you can go, Love and Hip Hop is music based. Yep. But if, even if you go and you go to, let's say you go to the, 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 the Biggest Chef. There's another show called The Biggest Chef. And they're cooking. But these, and it's about food and it's about cooking. But these people have crazy things going on in their lives. Mm -hmm. Or if you go to a million dollar listing. You're a real estate dude. I'm sure you've seen Million Dollar Listing. It's Absolutely. all them dudes that go out there and they have, they sell these big houses, and, but they want to go into the background. Oh, the reason that you're positioned in this real estate company is because your dad owned it. Oh, the reason that your position is this because you and your wife lumped up in you. So they, it's all up. So it becomes the, the major part of the show becomes the back burner for who you really are as a person. And that goes across all reality shows. If you come on here and you're a bartender, they want to see you bartend, of course. But they also want to see who you go home to, 
how many kids you got, how difficult it is for you to bartend with the life that you have created. I have two kids. I got to leave the house every night at nine o'clock and go to the club. It's difficult for me. My baby father, is a, does he sleeps. So that's the kind of difficulties they want to see. So the bartending takes a back seat to who you actually are as a person. Got you. Say I'm blessed enough. I'm fortunate enough. Mm -hmm. I make it on to the show. Do I have any, and I mean any, negotiating power when it comes to those contracts? Or is it that so many people want to make it on to these shows, they give you, you know, those contracts that, that you pretty much are giving them everything. If you decide, say you blow up here and I go on to another show, well, I, well now they got a piece of that because they damn near made you on this show. Do you have any right. power whatsoever? No. When you, no. Quite, really? no. Um, see, now, see, things are getting different. So I, let me take that back. I'll give you an example. Cardi B was an example. Cardi B came on Love & Hip Hop, but she had already had a humongous online fan base. So they kind of didn't do the regular interview process for her. They were kind of recruiting her because of her online fan base and the skits that she was doing. And she was already a known commodity in New York. And they knew that she was going to, the amazing television. So it was a lot different for her than if you're just a regular person, an artist that's coming on and you're trying to get your music out and you're just trying to look for a shot. You're just looking for the next shot. It's different. So I would say that 9.9% .9 of the people, because there's only been one Cardi B, right? Yep. Those type of people have different leverage. It's all about who you are and how you come in, as opposed to the round out cast. So the cast will always have a couple of people. Candy Burgess on the Housewives was a known commodity in the music industry and she was this and she was that. Then you have other women that were models 20, 30 years ago. So they kind of lost that status. So they don't have the same bargaining power as somebody who just wrote three number one hits two months ago versus a woman who was modeling 30 years ago and wants to get back on TV because she's gotten cold and now she wants to turn it around and this TV show can help her get back on top. So there's a difference. And then they have the regular person who is just an artist that's struggling that has an amazing story. They don't have that power. They don't have any power. So it's, there's, there's levels to this. And then of course, if you're Richie Dallas, who came on with very little power because you came on as Olivia's manager, but over time, now they're following you. And then it was Erica Minnan, and it was Johnny Blaze, and it was this, and it was that. Now you start getting your power through the years. So it's, it's, like, it's, it's almost like any other job. If you come in and you had a great job before and they know who you are, they're gonna offer you a big check. But if you come in and you just graduated from college and you really have no resume, then they're not gonna offer you a big check. And that's kind of the way it is in this reality world. Leads me to my next question. <laughs> You just said, Richie Dollars, over the years, you have progressed. If I come on to a show and I'm nobody, but I'm locked into a bad contract, is there room a few seasons down the road, a season or two down the road to renegotiate if your stock climbs within mm -hmm. that show? Or is it, hey, you signed on the dotted line. So well, you know, now. bringing the ratings in, but... You, you know, you just got to eat what, what you signed two, three years ago. It's just like any other kind of deal. If you come in, you have to know you have to be willing to say, y'all don't want to renegotiate. So y'all come in like, okay, let's just throw numbers out. Throw numbers. So you come in and it's like, okay, you get $5,000 an episode. And you turn into somebody who's worth $30,000 an episode. They're not going to offer you that. They're not going to wake up one morning and be like, oh, Rich, we, we love you. We think we want to give you. You have to decide that I don't want to do this show and understand that you're on the contract to this show. So if you walk away from this show, probably means you've walked away from reality television because they own the rights to who you are. So you can't just say, oh, they don't want to give me no money. I blew up on Love & Hip Hop. Now I'm going to go down the block to growing up hip hop and I'm going to take their money. No, because you're locked into what's called cycles. Cycles are seasons. So until that season that you have committed to is over, you cannot come back on TV. <laughs> if in fact you want to walk away. So if I go on Love and Hip Hop and my first contract was the three cycle season, I mean the three cycle contract, three seasons from now, I can't do any reality television until that third season is officially over. 
and then I become a free agent again. So if I decide that I want to quit and I'm not getting the money and they're not going to try to help me and they're not going to come to the negotiating table, I have to be prepared to walk away. Or Go ahead. take short. Or take shorts. I love that you bring this up, Rich. I just want, just for clarity for the audience, you're talking about cycles. Cycles equals seasons. Correct. Is it cycles that you, the talent, are on the show? Or is it three, let's just say three cycles. Is it right. three seasons that the show takes place? Meaning, if you did- Three seasons season, at the show. Excuse me? Mm-hmm. Uh, let, me just, let me just three cycles now. is three. Let me just get the question out. Go ahead. Stay Rich Dollars does the okay. show one season. That's one cycle. I don't like that I'm getting paid. You know, I signed under duress. I, you know, I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm a big name within this establishment now. Y'all don't want to pay me no more. I'm going to sit this out. Is it you have to wait for the show? It's, and say you walk away for the show itself to have two more seasons? Or if you did choose to come back one day, then you're coming back into cycle two and cycle three, even though three, four, five cycles have now passed in terms of the show itself with or without you on it. No, if you, come, if you go and you say, I'm doing three cycles, you have to sit out for three cycles. So whether you're on that show or not, you have to sit out three, technically, essentially, you're sitting out three years. So it's a three-year deal. If you do it one year and you sit out the next two, then your contract is over when cycle three, season three, ends. Now you've ended. Now you can go and do whatever you want to do. Understood. So that's the difficulty of it. Great point, Rich. You're on the show now. And before I even go there, are there lawyers for somebody – who is entry level, they make it onto mm -hmm. the show, they get a contract. Are there attorneys that specialize in this area? Or can you hire your uncle who's an attorney, but he might be a criminal attorney? Are, you know, should you focus on attorneys who have a background in nothing but reality TV? I think that well, now that reality has become so big, they have attorneys that are specializing in reality television because there are all so many milks and crannies and nuances of these contracts. But before you would hire an entertainment lawyer, I would never tell anybody to do a contract on their own, mm -hmm. nor would I tell anybody to, do a, to use someone who isn't a professional and has experience and knows what they're doing in the entertainment world. Because this love and hip hop con or reality television contract is going to be the same as a music contract. They're all, you have to have specialization in knowing what these different terminologies mean. You have to know what everything means or else you're going to be screwed. Now, what happens to people is you come in for so little money that they don't want to share that money. So they don't want to forego that first season of money because they say, ah, I, got, I don't want to, I'm going to just sign on the line. I, I understand it. I get it. But they don't understand the nuances. So now you didn't hire a lawyer. You signed a contract on home because you just wanted to be on television. And that's what they hope you do because now they got you. When there were some things, they were prepared to say, oh, your lawyer's not with that. Okay, you, they would have they bended on those things because they know that some of that stuff isn't, should never be signed. But it's not their job to determine what you're going to sign and what you're not. It's your job. But the money is so short coming into the game they don't want to pay a lawyer that $2,500 or that $3,000 to review and go back and forth with these people and get on the clock. So they just sign it and then they're screwed. Got you. You're bringing up money, which brings me to rates. I'm Sean Prez. Never been on a reality TV show star. I am from Wisconsin somewhere. They like me. I made the show. Give me a range. What am I looking at coming onto a show? And in... I don't know if it is specific to each show, meaning you can only speak for love and hip hop, or mm -hmm. is there a, a standard range that entry level talent comes in at? Well, there's a standard range that entry level comes in at. Actually, over the years, um, the show that I'm on actually has gotten a lot better about paying 
their people. Um, with that being said, entry level position for on a reality show, thirty five hundred an episode. It's not bad. Now, if you're walking into this thing and you're saying I want to do it, and you get picked up, probably thirty five hundred an episode. If there's ten, if there's ten episodes, and that's thirty five thousand dollars. So it's not, it's not, no, it's, it's not crazy. It's not going to make you quit your day job. It's not going to make you live, but you've also got to take into consideration that no reality show shoots all season. So you're probably going to make $35,000 in three months. So if you, if you're making 10,000, you know, $12,000 a month, then, then, then I guess you can frown upon that. But if you're making $35,000 and you walk away in three months with $35,000, then I, then that's not so bad, I guess, for somebody who's starting off and doesn't have anything like, going for themselves in terms of just being liked by the cat, by the production and wanting you to be on the show, but you didn't come in with platinum records. You don't come in with some kind of crazy history. You don't come on with some enormous social media buzz around you and your relationship or what's going on or who you're dating or who you are. And you're just a person that wants to come on this show. I'm looking at $3,500 an episode. How long is a typical season? You said 12 weeks. We shoot from, yeah, about three months. Okay. So if we start, if we, if cameras go up in, if cameras go up in October, we probably are finished in by January, November, December, November, October, November, December, and then January we're done. And then they bring you back. Huh? What does a typical shoot week look like? And then, and I I think I know where you were about to go. And let's go where you were about to go. You said they bring you back. I'm assuming that's for the reunions. The, the reunions, exactly. So what they do with the reunions is you shoot the show. Mm-hmm. Most of these shows aren't shot in real time. So we're not shooting on Thursday and it's coming on TV Monday night. Some of these shows are shot weeks in advance. So I don't really know what Sean's been saying about me. I don't really, Richie, Sean doesn't know what Richie's been saying about him. So in order for you to get the most bang for your buck, you finish the season or you almost finish the season. You put people on hiatus. And then you say, you know what? We're not shooting anymore for five weeks. Go home and watch the show. And then we want to bring you back. And now you got fireworks because this funny face made or this person says some slick comment or something about uh, this and that. And now all of a sudden you got fireworks and that takes you on through the end of the season and into your reunion. So that's kind of what they do. Got you. A typical shoot week. How many hours of my life do I need to be available to this? Is this a eight hour job? Is it 24 hours a day? Like, what, give, give me an idea of a typical shoot week and how much time is coming out of my personal life. If you're popping? No, my, you, if you, you're do, popping. Do it both ways, do it both ways. If you're popping okay. or if you're just a regular person on the show. If you're a regular person on the show and, you're, and you just the, two scenes a week, maybe one scene a week, one scene a week. You figure every, every episode usually takes two weeks. A week and a half is for one episode, right? Some scenes aren't going to go the way they want it to go. Some scenes are going to be crazy, and which means that they want to do follow-ups. So it's all based on if you're shooting and you're in the mix and you're doing really, really well, you could shoot three scenes a week. And those three scenes, probably two to three hours. So if you're popping, you're going to work nine hours a week. If you're popping, you're working nine hours per week. Three scenes a week, three hours a week, a scene, nine hours a week. You're popping. You, you've made three scenes. Now, remember, an episode is usually probably about 24 scenes. So if you're in three scenes out of 24, one week, then the next week is the, is the end of that. So if you make five scenes in one episode, you're popping. You're out of here. You're out of here. That means that you're doing, you're amazing. Because a lot of people get one scene, because you got to remember, other casts have scenes. And a lot of times they piggyback and put you in scenes with other people, just based on who you know and what, you, what your relationships are. So if you're doing a scene, that might not be your scene. But if you're doing five scenes a week, pretty much means that your storyline is amazing and that people are following your story. Like your story is a premiere story on that show. You become an A character. Got you. You you just mentioned being in other people's scenes. Mm -hmm. How much 
time in advance do they give you guys, you know, before you, before you get the call and say, hey, we need you available to be in X, Y, and Z scene? Is it a day, is it a week in advance? Might be the night before. Might no, it's definitely not a week in advance. You get your schedule, like say you get a schedule, you get a schedule every Sunday, and that has your week. But then, like I said, things happen during that week that they might somebody might get sick and they don't want to shoot, they don't want to shoot, or they're sick and we don't want to shoot with them. So now it's like, oh my God, can we call Rich and we can we push his stuff that we were gonna do next week to this week? And it only benefits you. So I would always tell everybody if they call you to shoot, be this is your job. So just because you're only shooting three times a week, don't get lax and think that, oh, my schedule said I'm only shooting once because they could pick you up. They could call you on Tuesday night at 10 o'clock and say, yo, Sean, I need you at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. You available? And that's only more money for you. So, of course, or it's only another opportunity for you to be on the TV screen. So, of course, you want to be as visible and as ready to shoot as they want you to be. So, yeah. Are you involved in the storyline at all? Or they just call you and feed you to the wolves. Like, hey, we need you at such and such bar at such and such time. And you're just walking into the unknown. Do you have any idea of what you're walking into? Or well, as talent, are you involved in creating a storyline? Well, you're involved in creating storyline, which just goes back to what I was telling you earlier. They're going to find the people you mess with, the people you don't mess with, they're gonna be able, through TV, through the video, they're gonna know all the different things. Or this per you say, Sean Press says, oh, I'm the president of Power Moves, and somebody in a later scene be like, he ain't the president. You're good, there's gonna, they're gonna make you address it. So everything you say, everything everybody else says is video camera. The, the, the looks of video camera, the words of video camera, the, the, the reactions to what people are saying about you is video camera, and they're gonna start to make that kind of become your story. So for instance, I'm working, I'm doing something, all of a sudden, Rich Dallas says, oh, this is the hottest record in the world. And then another person hears that record at a later date, and they're like, oh yeah, Rich said he got the hottest record in the world. And Sean looks at that person and is like, God, yeah, that record ain't hot. Expect to address that. Expect to address that. Or if you're like, oh, my girlfriend's name is such and such, and then another person comes and says, oh, my girlfriend's name is such and such, expect to address that. So if they're not, you're going to have to address everything that's said, everything that's done, every reaction. They're going to put you in positions to now you're going to go into a scene and they're going to be like, nah, Rich, tell them what you said. <laughs> tell them what you you know what I'm saying? And that's, that's what the producers do. That's what, that's what they call being produced. Now you're being produced. So now it's like, oh, no, nah, we're not lying about what you said. You said that. We have it on videotape. So could you please go say that? Go say that to him? Or they'll show it in your green screen or you're watching the television show and they'll show people talking about you and saying things about you that now you have to address. So is it fair to say, is it fair to say that these shows to some point or some extent are scripted? I never like to say they're scripted because the reality is you, what you do today creates your scene for tomorrow. Whereas in a scripted television show, they write you out. They write what you're supposed to do and what it's supposed to be. So it really has nothing to do with you. If you watch, I don't know, Law and Order or whatever these shows, these shows are going to go and they're going to be and Ice-T is going to act this way and this is who he is. What you do today in reality television will determine what happens to you tomorrow when seen. So it's not really scripted. Now, do they follow stories? And do they, of course. Are they going to put you in positions now to act on the things that you've said or done or reacted to before? Of course. Are they going to make you acknowledge to that person what was said about him when he wasn't around? Of course. So they're, they're, they're very, 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 they're sticklers for that. They're going to pay attention to all your under the breath comments, all the little nuances of what you're doing in terms of how you react to somebody's success or failure. They're going to take all that and they're going to put it in front of you and they're going to let that person see it 
So even a person who you thought you might have been cool with, you may not be cool with because now you're watching their reactions. That's not scripted, but yet that show is going to make that thing play out. Do you have any control whatsoever over your likeness? No. Once you sign on the data lines, you're just, that's, you've, you've signed over your likeness to them. So if I'm a person, I desperately want to get on a reality TV show, I have to know the moment that I sign my name to that dotted line, the moment that I accept the check from these people, they are in control of my likeness in the way that my character, my imagery is put out to the world. Yo, Sean, people get mad every day. People get mad every day and be like, oh my God, I hate how I'm being portrayed. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. Because you got to remember, there's, there is a such thing as the power of editing, right? And, and everything is not so black and white. It's, it's some, sometimes it's just real ambiguous how you reacted to a situation, but because it wasn't good TV, they didn't play it out like that. Now, I'm not saying that all shows do this, but I've been around shows or heard about shows where they literally will take a conversation that me and you are having today and use that conversation in a whole different context and turn it all the way upside down. And all you can do is take the social media, explain about how that wasn't how it went down, that wasn't how it happened. But at the end of the day, that shit made television and they put you on TV and portrayed you however they wanted to. <laughs> and then you gotta go to social media. That means now you gotta go. <laughs> exactly. Now, and people, and they do it all the time now. They go on there and they argue and they complain and oh my God, I can't believe, I didn't even say that to him. That was a whole nother scene. They, why are they doing me like this? But they have that power. Nothing Rich, you can do. How close is your love and hip hop character to the rich that I know? Are you guys one and the same? When you go on that show, are you somebody completely different because you understand I am doing a job and I just accept all that comes with it? How close should anybody when they go on these shows, how much of Sean is actually going to be portrayed to the world? Or is it how much I decide to give? It's about, it's about how much you decide to give. And if you decide that you want to give, Richie Dollars has evolved, right? Yep. And part of that evolution of Rich Dollars evolved from the guy who worked at Bad Boy that was managing Olivia, that was real, real, real gung-ho about you know, his music and video and, and, and being a success in the music industry has evolved into something else through years. Through years, you date people. Through years, you different things and your path goes a different direction. And, and following that path, I've strayed away from music. Yeah, but I, I, I guess I'm asking a different question, right? Not to give insider trader information, but mm -hmm. we'll go back to maybe your season one, season two. Richie Dollars was willing to go on the little bridge with a poodle and cry. And I remember you telling me specifically, Sean, I had to do this because Olivia wouldn't. So exactly. I'm carrying the weight for our storyline. So that's why I ask you, and this is for any, and I'm not making it about you. I'm trying to make it for anybody yeah. who is looking and want to be in your shoes one day. How close is the characters versus who you people are as real life human beings? Remember, remember what you said about me when we first started this interview. You say, you know, Rich was willing to do whatever it took to win. Yes. In this reality world, and this is probably the biggest nugget I can give you, you have to be able to want to win. And winning means different things to, me, to different people, right? For Olivia, winning was being on there and not ever having to give anything up and kind of fading to black. But she, if, you, if you were to ask her today, she'd probably be like, I wouldn't do it any differently. Mm -hmm. I want to be here. I want to be successful. I want a 10 year run. To me, success is a 12, is a 12 season, 10 year run. And a couple million dollars later, that's success to me. But sometimes success to other people is what, how you're being portrayed, how people will look at you on Tuesday morning when social media hits, how all those things. If you want to be successful in reality TV, you have to be able to put yourself out there. Don't take yourself too 
seriously that you that you're scared to do anything because the reality is some of the things that you do are going to make you relatable to people crying on the bridge for me wasn't something that i would do it was something that i had to do because my desire to win way 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 was bigger than my desire or my lack of desire to be clowned on social media that changed everything and that's the way this reality thing works people who give it all and leave it all on the table are stars the people who come in here with ulterior motives and are trying to get something other than making good tv you're gonna lose you're going to lose and that's just the way it is so yes put it all on the table is the, is the key to success for this show don't hold nothing back reality tv is like marriage there is somebody for everybody so no matter how crazy you think you are if your show is reached in enough homes they're going to be people who relate to that because there's somebody for everybody no matter what you did there's somebody for everybody rich you just alluded to tuesday morning i want to go there for a second mm -hmm. your particular reality show comes on monday nights right and i'll never forget speaking to you many years ago because you were willing to do things i was you know i, I wouldn't be successful on reality tv mm -hmm. you've been extremely successful Tuesday morning, I remember you telling me this. Sean, I hate waking up on Tuesday morning. Social media is going crazy. Morning show radio is going crazy. People are just slinging mud at my name. It's just so much talk. Number one, how long did it take for you to adjust to being in the public eye and secondly, how long did it take for you to adjust? Because you have to be, you have to be somebody who, 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 like when we were young and our parents tell us sticks and stones break your bones, but words that never hurt me, you, that, that's easier said than done. How long did it that's take for you to adjust to these, these just words? Say what you want to say. I'm making money. It, well, first of all, When I used to have those conversations with you, it was because I was having a hard time dealing with it. Because as much as we were lived in a public eye, working at Bad Boy and being out in the clubs every night and people knowing exactly who we were, it wasn't the same thing as a, as a, as a national bombardment of crying on the bridge or whatever the case may be. That bothered me for years. It bothered me. It still bothers me to this day. At times, I find myself going on Twitter or Instagram and trying to and maybe arguing with people. Then I realize, what am I doing? Like... At some point, you have to be comfortable enough in what you deem to be your success. People are like, yo, you lost all your musical credibility. You lost this. Oh, my God, you out here with these birds. You're doing A, B, C, and E. But you know what? In my heart of hearts, I know that I can talk to Sean Prez, who knows Richie Dollars, who named Richie Dollars, Richie Dollars, and can have a conversation. I'm never going to lose my credibility to the people who I ever had credibility for or to. I have to understand that. And people have to understand that. So if, you're, if your home isn't, I guess, if your home isn't in place and you really are worried about what other people are saying, it's going to bother you forever. Because there's not a day you're going to wake up and you're going to go to social media and somebody's not saying something negative. Because you got to understand that that's just what they do. There's somebody in Chicago right now that looked at me and was like, yo, this clown happening. And then they're on social media and they're typing it in and they're hitting me up and they're telling me how much of a clown I am. And that's just bothers. I mean, you want to argue with that person, but the reality is you're giving them what they want. You're giving them the attention that they want. It took me a long time to understand that this is what I signed up for. And I tell people all the time, I don't get mad when people be like, nigga, you old, you whack, you was music industry. You wasn't in no music. I signed up for this. I signed up to go on TV and for people to forget about my musical past because that's what happens when you're 10 years removed from doing anything of substance. I've been doing reality TV for the last 10 years. So anybody who knows Richie Dollars today is going to know Richie Dollars from Love and Hip Hop. They're not going to know Rich Dollars from Bad Boy unless I get on the phone, talk to you, talk to Kid Joe, talk to such and such, all these random DJs from all over the country who knew me and knew my get down. That's how I 
at times ground myself because I got to go back to the people that actually know who you are. And if you haven't lost your credibility to them, how am I going to get mad at a girl who was 10 years old when I started this and she's 20 years old now and she don't know that I broke all these records, that we broke all these records at Bad Boy, Jock, Cassie, uh, Cherry, all these people. They don't know that. They don't know that. So it's, it's, it, would be, it would be counterproductive for me to be mad at them for coming at me about who I am and what I've become when I signed up for it. So just know what you're signing up for. And, and if you want to hold on to it, and that's a number one problem with a lot of artists that do these reality shows. They come on this and they're trying to hold on to this artistry that's been gone. Bro, you ain't hot no more. You ain't been hot in 12, 13 years. So stop trying to come on here with this demeanor or this persona that you so hot and you the hot artist. Nigga, you ain't been hot in 15 years. You're a reality dude now. Like, you're a reality dude now. So when you accept that, move forward with that, make your money based on that, the tweets and stuff don't really bother you because the only reason you're going to be bothered by saying somebody saying you're, you're an old whack rapper is if that you're still thinking you're a young hot rapper. That's how you, that's what bothers you. And that's what I've learned to do. People say, oh, bad boy, oh, you wasn't that bad. All right, well, that's cool. That's cool because now I'm 12 years deep on loving hip hop. It's a whole nother life. It's a whole nother life for me. And I can't get mad at it because I chose it. Do you have, and I guess I'm asking this, just knowing you as a person and also for somebody who's just looking in, do you have regrets about doing this show? About putting your life out there, about exposing the innermost details of your personal life? Are there regrets that you have in what do you do to protect your mental health? And what advice can you give to somebody who may be starting this journey on what you've learned and how they can protect their mental health early? Do I have regrets? Absolutely. I have regrets every day I wake up and I wonder what would have happened if we still did the musical thing and, and we were, and where would we be today had I just stayed the path and stayed the course of what we were doing back then? Um, then I look and I say, you know what, you've made, you've, you've made it, you've, you're successful at what you're doing. You've made a lot of money at what you're doing. You've been able to provide for yourself and live in, in 12 years, 10 years have gone by and that you've never wanted for anything. So you have to almost say, you know, it was in the cards for me. And then I look at the music industry and I also look and I say a lot of things have gone on in the music industry. It's really, really almost down to a crawl now, right? And people lost jobs. And then you look back and you'd be like, would that have been a safer thing? Maybe, maybe not. Because we don't know what God has in store for us from day to day, much less 10 years later. So for me to go back and in hindsight say, I regret this choice. I'm not going to say I regret this choice. I'm going to say I have regret choices within this choice. If I had things to do over again, I would have done them differently. But then I wouldn't be rich dollars, right? If I went to Bad Boy and I even, if, we could have the same conversation about music. If I went in and you say, you're rich, do you regret the things that you did when you were running out in clubs and doing this every night? Doing this and doing that. And all the things that I did wrong that probably only me and you know about. I would regret them if I could do them again, but they also made me who I am. So at the end of the day, you have to be comfortable enough in your own skin. Don't do this reality thing because if you're not comfortable in your own skin, if you're not comfortable with who you are, the shit is going to eat you up. The people are going to eat you up. The social media is going to eat you up. The, the radio morning shows are going to eat you up. And if you're not cool with who you are and the decisions that you make in life and what you are trying to accomplish, then you're going to lose your mind and you will not be able to maintain mental health. You will absolutely go crazy. You will absolutely lose your mind trying to fight and argue and <laughs> tweet people and, you know, all day and all night. The shit just becomes too time consuming and too strenuous on your, on your mind that you, you, you're going crazy. You just have to take it for what it is. Have you ever sought therapy or is it just you? I'm just trying to get to what are your practices for protecting yourself? 
you, you know, did you I'm, talk to somebody? Do you just shut down and close out the world? Um, I used to shut down and close out the world. I, you know, you remember when I used to go to Miami and I would tell you, we would talk and I would be walking around and be like, yo, Sean, this is the most therapeutic thing in the world. I'm not dealing with nobody. I live a bunch of, around a bunch of old white Russians. They don't know who I am and I don't have to deal with it. And I just, in my, in my, I'm in Miami and I'm, and it's cool. But then you start to realize that you can't just do that for three, four months out of the year. You just take, take yourself out of civilization. So What's therapy for me is talking to people like you or, or Ron Stewart, the people that I know that know my past and they know you for who you are or your family members for that matter, but they know who you are and what you've done. And we can have conversations that aren't reality show related that kind of puts you back and it kind of keeps you grounded. But that's what works for me. I don't, I can't tell you what works for the next person because a lot of people within this, within this reality, world they don't have the infrastructure that i have they don't have somebody they can call they don't have the, the mom that they can go back and have so it, it kind of weighs on them and then also another thing be very careful what you ask for because starting is not always an amazing thing everybody knowing who you are and what you're doing all times of the day is not always what you want you want the attention but at the same time it's not always the best thing for your mental health Sometimes you do need to, to, to be able to go away and, and, and to talk to people and have a, a, a structure of people that are going to love you for who you are and loved you before, you before all of this stuff happens. Because this, it also gets weird. It gets weird. Every day it gets weird with, with people and who you talk to and how they talk to you and what they expect from you and what they expect that you are because they've seen you on television when they really don't even know the real you. Let's move this forward a little bit. You said someone entry level can make maybe $3,500 a week or an episode. You're shooting over 12 weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, whatever that might be. You, 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 know, mm -hmm. you probably can't live off of $35,000 a year, $45,000 a year. Talk to me about other revenue streams that somebody who's aspiring to do this, how has this helped you? make money in different areas when you guys are not shooting? Hostings? Well, first and foremost, that's the number one thing. There used to be, like I said, everything, life, the world has evolved. There used to be a time when you used to have to go to clubs and you have to want to sing a song. And that's how you got hostings. And those people who sang songs or had hit records, they were able to go around the country and make ten, fifteen thousand $15,000 a night hosting clubs. Now, because of what reality TV is, and I told you that there is always somebody for, there's somebody for everybody, people want to party and drink with you. They want to party and drink with the crazy dude from Monday nights at 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. They want to party and drink with Stevie J and Richie Dollars and so on, whoever the case may be, Candy Burris or Portia or whoever. You have created a base of people now that they want you to advertise their products because obviously through the social media, you've, you've, now you have a humongous following. So now they want you to advertise their products. They want you to talk about their products. That's money. They want you to go to the club. That's money. People want to party and drink with you. That's money. People want to ask you advice and they want to, if you're a music person on the show and people, there's a person in middle America and because of social media has made things so, made everybody so accessible, there's money to be made. Or you can go and you can do tours. Or you can just, whoever you become, whoever that person is that you become on that show, you can monetize that. So if you're on that show and you're an alcoholic, then that's the worst thing you can be, right? And you're on there and you're an alcoholic, there's going to be some liquor people that want to be like, yo, Richie Dollars, tell everybody how you, how you love my liquor, <laughs> right? Or if you're out there and you're a manager, there's going to be a million people that want you to come to their town and they want you to, 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 to do showcases because... That's who you. That's who you are. If you, even if even if you're not one on, you know that commercial where they'd be like, "I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV." Mm -hmm. That's kind of what this has become. Like you, like you're so, like, in that realm. Like that's who you are to these people. So they look at you as that. So now people are literally bringing you to their town, and you're endorsing products, and you're doing hostings, and you're doing showcases, and all these different things because that's who they view you as, and that's the money. That's the real money. That's really the real money of this when you're first starting. The real money is to get in there, make a name for yourself, and be the new hot commodity.
to where now everybody wants you in their town. Everybody wants you to, you know, uh, promote their, 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 their products and stuff. That's the real money. So the 35, the 38, the 45, or whatever that amount of money is in that 12 week span, that turns into a hundred because now you're getting $5,000 to leave the house and you do 20 of them and you just made a hundred, you know what I'm saying? You just made a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. That's the real money initially until you become a Richie Dollars and you're 12 years in and you've been everywhere. So it's not the same. They want the new hot person to come, but now I've made that money up because now I've been able to increase my value within the show. I make my money on the show and I don't have to leave the house as much anymore. So the goal is to get hot the same way we, you said it in promo. If you get hot, you're going to get the money. I used to complain, Prez, I need money, Prez, I need money. If you get hot, the money going to come. Get hot first and then sit back and watch the money come. And that's the same principle. If, same I'm, principle. Successful, if, if, if huh? I'm successful, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm not asking you specifically. So take this as a, as, as a general question. Sean Prez goes on a reality TV show, and I'm successful. Season over season, they're bringing me back. Now I'm going from one scene to three scenes, and week over week, I might be in five scenes. What type of money can a reality TV show star who is successful, who considers themselves successful, actually make? If an entry-level... Um, talent can make 3500 is it the sky's the limit you know i once heard watching the jersey shore that they held out and they were getting something like a million dollars an episode like what are we talking for successful stars successful stars first of all that's predicated on successful shows so if you're the it's like if you're the best person on a bad team what's your what's really your value right uh-huh. But if you're on a successful show and you're a successful person on a successful show, you can make millions of dollars a year. Make on millions contract? of dollars a year. Is, is, is on, that on contract or is that with all contract? Affiliate? You can make, you, if you're on contract, you can make $50,000 an episode. And if you're doing 20 episodes, that sounds like a million dollars. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're doing fifty thousand dollars episode, and if you're, and that's just like that's super successful. That's really successful. Now people do things differently, also. Mm-hmm. Like, Love and Hip Hop pays you by episode. The Housewives they don't pay you by episode. You work out an, a fee and you get your fee, and and within that fee, you have, because you're married, you have to share some of that money with your husband, because men don't get paid on Housewives. Just like on Marriage Boot Camp, you can go on to Boot Camp and make a quarter million dollars and. 17 days, but you got to share that $17 million. I mean, that seven, that, um, you got to share that $250,000 with the person you bring on the show. So they only recruit one person and the person you bring on is your job to, to take care of them. Hold on. Whoa, so whoa, everybody whoa. has different whoa. kind of scenarios. <laughs> Hold on. So you're telling me when I'm watching shows like marriage Boot Camp, they actually hire one of those people. And that person, it's their job to bring their partner on the show and determine what their partner is going to get. Their partner does not. So, have- no, yeah, exactly. So, like, for instance, I go on marriage boot camp and I, they're like, okay, Richie Dallas, we want you on marriage boot camp. Oh, my God, who's your girlfriend? Oh, my girlfriend is so-and-so. Okay, can we get an interview? Can we meet y'all? Blah, blah, blah. But no, I'm the person that's, I'm, this is my money. Unless we work it out separately that, Oh, I don't want to pay her taxes or whatever the case may be. I, but I'm determining your worth because you're coming on with me. So, yes, I can obviously say, what's the fee? $200,000? You want to work for $50,000 for the next 17 days? Cool. Let's do it. So, yes, when you see those people, you like, I can, if you go watch this show right now, there's a few people on there where you'd be like, oh, I know her. Never seen dude before in my life. That dude's not making no money. You know what I'm saying? She's taking the, the lion's share of that and he's getting peanuts. Or there's two people that were on other shows together and he's like, oh, okay, they probably split that even, even because they're together and that's their relationship. But I don't know that. Oh, I know that guy. I don't know that girl. That girl's not making what that guy is making. He's taking the lion's share of that and throwing her something. 
but that's determined. That's within what they want. However, they work that out for sure. For sure. Crazy. Um, you're nearing the end of your career within that show in particular. Mm -hmm. You're already 10 seasons in. Who knows how long the franchise will be around? God willing, it'll be around for years. Right. Who knows how long you'll be on it? What is your, I've been asking you general questions, but this is more specific to you. What are your future plans? The future plans, the problem, the future plans is, for me is to obviously move out of this genre and move into stuff. So I've been doing, so you have to set up for, you know, you set up for war in times of peace. So you try to, you try to put your, you try to put all your little things together. And I have an app out now um, that I'm very, very excited about. Um, I've been doing sports talk radio in Georgia. I told you that for, for a few years now. And nobody really knows about these things because I haven't really been able to put them on the forefront of what my day-to-day -day activities are. But these are seeds that I'm planting that when this love and hip hop boat stops sailing, I can always move into another genre and do something different, which will be another phase of life. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. I'm kind of looking to involve myself in things that I'm interested in. Um, I've made some decent money. I'm obviously I'm getting older now. So, you know, the things that you want aren't the same. Like if you haven't, if you haven't gotten pretty much what you want by the time you're 44, man, I don't know. Right. So I expect that life is going to slow down for me. And then it's going to go back to a normal situation, a normal job. Whereas if I'm doing sports talk radio in Georgia and I'm talking about the Hawks and the, and, the, and, the, and the Braves or whatever I'm doing, the Georgia Bulldogs, then that's fine. That's, that's what I want to do moving forward. You know, that's something that, um, and I asked you this for a reason, um, because obviously I know your history, but off record, you are an encyclopedia when it comes to sports. Um, your knowledge about baseball, <laughs> Rich, you're on TV. Like, you have to stop moving this camera. Um, so you, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. But the, the, you're not <laughs> about baseball, basketball, just sports in general is second to none. And I always hope that you would find your way into that field because you are so much more than Richie Dollars from Love and Hip Hop. So I'm glad to hear you say that. And I really hope that moving forward, you embrace that side of yourself because with your following and with the legions of people who know you, whether they love you, hate you or whatever, they will tune into you and understand that you are extremely credible. And I always wondered why you never incorporated that side of yourself into the show itself, meaning the reality TV. I've wanted to. I've wanted to incorporate that into this, but it's, like I said, this, this reality world is a give and a take. So oftentimes, that's not who our demographic is. That's not what people care to see. Mm -hmm. And they're just not interested in it. So at times, you have to take the good with the bad. And if I want to, and that's why, you know, you, you have to give as much as you can get to create, excuse me, you have to give as much as you can give to create enough power for you to start doing things that not necessarily so interesting to the public. And that's what I think I've done. I just haven't been able to do that. I haven't been able to do that because it, it, it's, just not, it's just not our demo. And it kind of becomes, you know, it becomes useless if I'm out here promoting things that nobody cares about. So I almost have to do that on my own. It's like, okay, we're gonna give you the platform and we're gonna create a scenario for which you can go out here and you can do these things, but do them on your own time. Understood. So it's, it's, a, it's a give and a take. Before we close out, what advice would you give to aspiring reality TV show stars? An aspiring reality TV star, I would say, create a buzz about yourself. Create a buzz about yourself. And regardless of what it is you're doing, if you're a rapper in your, in your town and you're local and you want, you have to create because you have to go into that scenario knowing that you're worth. You have to go into that situation knowing what you're worth or else they will take advantage of you. So you have to create a place where you are somebody and they want you on this show. There's a humongous difference between being recruited and recruiting. 
I don't, I don't, I want to be recruited for this show because when I go and I'm getting recruited for this show, I understand my worth and I can ask and I can stick you up and I can make these, these modifications to my contract that a person who's recruiting the show couldn't do. So when the show is reaching out to you, you know, you're doing something right. When you're reaching out to the show, you got, got all the leverage. You, they got all the leverage they got they're gonna and they're going to use all the leverage because remember we used to talk about this all the time just like an interning when you were when i was in the music industry and it was in just a hundred people that wanted to be richie dollars there's a hundred people that wanted to work at bad boy records that work for sean Press. there's a hundred we revolutionized that and people understood that so they wanted to be a part of it so when you sitting in your office and you making your way for two hours to come and do an interview and this is how much do you really want it versus if I was that hot promo guy and everybody's like, oh my God, Sean, you got to hire him. I don't know if you would have changed because that's who you are. But nine out of 10 people would have treated people differently based on how they're coming through the door. You go how you come. Understood. That's Last question for you. Shoot. Was it all worth it? 10 years, 12 seasons later, absolutely. <laughs> Get it, Rich. Absolutely. <laughs> I've, en I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it, Sean. It's, there's a, a lot of BS along that goes along with it, but I've, en I've enjoyed it, man. I've enjoyed it. I really have. With all of the BS that's come along with it. With all of the BS that's come along with it. And it's been a lot. When I reflect back on these last 10 years, and I say, I've enjoyed it. Good for you. When you can look back, when you can look back at a 10 year span of time and you can see that there have been potholes in your in your journey, but the journey is still like that still means like it's, you still makes you happy to look back. Then you have to say you, that you, I have to say that I've been, it's, it's, it's been worth it. Good man. Good man. Rich, where can everyone find you? Um, Rich Dollars on Twitter, R-I-C-H-D-O-L-L-A-Z on Twitter, Richie Dollars, R-I-C-H-I-E, D-O-L-L-A-Z on Instagram, and Rich Trowers, T-R-O-W-E-R-S on Facebook. And that's kind of all I got. Rich, for one, I want to thank you for your candor, your transparency, your willingness to provide so many invaluable gems, like the education that you, this interview will give to anybody who's aspiring to become what you've become, to fill your shoes, to be the next reality show star. You know, you just gave them 10 years of education and I can't thank you enough. You are a true power move maker. Thank you. My brother. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate that, man. And you know what? Anything you need, you know you calling me. It's all whatever, you know. So I, I like to give out information because I, when I was young, I wanted somebody to give me this information. I had a Sean Price. You know what I mean? I had people that were in my corner that were like, like, okay, this is how you do. So I would like to give that out. So I appreciate the opportunity to come on here and, and disseminate this information because I think it's useful. It is. It is. But, you know, th think about how much if, if 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 somebody had done an interview like this how much of the process would it have cut off for you it's 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 like skipping grades or you know you 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 just gave people so much wisdom and so much education if they just take time and focus on your words i think that you're going to save them years of what they would have had to go through and experience and find out on their own. So I appreciate you, brother. Absolutely. Thanks, Sean. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.